How are you? Good. This meeting is Good. being recorded. Oh. That was weird. <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> All right. So let's kick it off with Jean. I know where you're coming in from. Share the rest of us. Where are you, where are you zooming in from? Um, I'm zooming in from the Boston area, about uh, in the suburbs, Lexington, Massachusetts. Go Celtics. Big game tonight. Yeah, there is. All right. Jason, where are you coming in from? I am uh, currently located in Martha's Vineyard, so not too far from Eugene. Nice. Yeah. I'm going to go around the room here. Uh, Rebecca. Hi, yeah, I am in Elmore, Ohio. Um, so just, hey, um, south of Ann Arbor, Michigan, north of Columbus. So, Thomas. Um, hi, guys. I'm coming to you from Guanacaste, Costa Rica. Nice. Kong. Hey, I'm from Laura, Maryland. Nice. Tamir. Seattle, Washington. Nice. Ken. Sunny LA, California. LA, California. Good evening, Will. Coming into us from uh, DC. DC. Heather, how are you tonight? I'm great. Thank you. From Victoria, British Columbia. Excellent. Ian, <laughs> how are you doing? Where are you coming in from? Westerly, Rhode Island. Westerly, Rhode Island. Amanda, how about you? Hi, good evening from Greenwich, in Connecticut. Connecticut. Karen, Karen, you with us? We've got Jana. What's up, Bolty? Hey, Karen. You're on mute. Come off. Oh, there we go. I'm calling in from Windsor, Ontario. Ontario. Bolte. Let's see, Nick. Hey, Nick. Let's see. I'll introduce where I'm coming in from. I'm currently in Orlando on spring break. <laughs> this is not mine, it's my daughter's. That's what bedazzled, they all say. Bedazzled, bedazzled many ears. That's why I'm casual. Let's see. Marquette, Michigan. Thanks, Jana. Give it one more minute. Hey, Nadine. Hi. Hey, where are you uh, zooming in from? I'm zooming in from Tawasan, British Columbia. Welcome. Thank you. Adam knows what that is. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> if you if you grew up like Heather and I did in Victoria, British Columbia, so Austin, you know so well because living on an island over here, we always take the ferry over, and so Austin is where the ferry comes in. So that's like a a childhood memory and an adult memory, and yeah, that's cool. What's up to Austin? That's a so very cool spelling. <laughs> yes, there's a trick. It's saw, was, sen, sent the T to the front. Love that. <laughs> Do you have a trick to remember that trick for me, Nadine? Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> it was told to me, and I went, yeah, I don't get it. I need to see it. I'm a visual person. Nice. Catherine Folk Sullivan. Good afternoon to you. How are Hi, you? Hi, Adam. Good. Oh, Jason. See you. Yes, that's me. Hi. You get to hear Adam later. Okay. Stuck with me for first. a little bit. Good to see you. Yeah. Bolty, are you with us? She might be. Oh, KG. I'm from so I'm listening to Cool. We can't hear you. Kristen Gerlag, what's up? Where are you coming in from tonight? I'm in Austin, Texas right now. Ooh, this is like the 18th place you've been in the last month. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always bouncing around. Yeah. All right. Everybody put your hands up. Show of hands with zero being, when I hear an objection, I want to run and I'm never doing this again. 10 being, I hope that my people that I'm talking to give me as many objections, more objections that I've ever heard in my life. How many objections do you like to hear inside of a sales process, no matter what that process is? Show of hands, zero, I despise it. 10, I'm looking for objections. 
Got a six, Adam. I'm like you, Adam. I'm like a five. Got a two. Casey kind of likes it. Hey, right, we got Jason. Are you former salesperson? Me too. KFS like a five. Nadine's like, no, I don't want to hear it. I want you to buy for me. Will, we got a five. So actually the average is, this is actually pretty good. Most people are okay with a little bit of objection handling. Second question, who has an active objection? Uh, who has an app active objection that they're working through with a potential client right now? Meaning you have a yes, but money, time, energy, not sure if coaching is the right fit. Gene, you've got one. Ian, you've got one. Will, you've got one. Kristen, you got one. Great. One of you four is going to participate with Adam tonight. So you just voluntold yourself. I want to tell you a little enrollment story. And for those of you who aren't on, I'm in Orlando right now. This is my daughter's mini ear, bedazzle mini ears. Not going to wear them the whole night. So I grew up a huge Star Wars fan and I made a big mistake in my enrollment with my daughter of going on Rise of the Resistance and Smuggler's Run with me the other night. She'd never been to Disney World and the very first thing I took her on was Space Mountain. Who here has been to space on Space Mountain? My daughter's six. She's 45 inches. Uh, she's 43 inches and the limit is 40 inches. She screamed the entire time. She doesn't want to do anything that involves any up and down and she will not go on Star Wars rides with me. And that was my main part about being excited about it. And so Adam, I'm excited to hear what you have first tonight around how to enroll when somebody is immovable. My daughter is completely immovable at this point. I did not do a good job of practicing enrollment with her and I set myself up for failure at the beginning. So I know we're going to learn more about that. And with that, I want to welcome you all here tonight, this afternoon, wherever you're coming in from and Casey, Love to hand it over to you. Thanks, Jason. Welcome, everyone. We're really excited you're all here to be in this conversation. Um, while you may not have objections that are as fierce as a six-year-old, um, we know that this is something that coaches struggle with. And so um, we are here with Adam Quiney to help us up-level where we are and how we support clients with potential objections. And a really quick intro on Jason and I and like what this is. Um, Excellence and Enrollment is a um, is a coaches community. So we are a free community by and for change makers who are committed to providing excellent coaching that in changing lives changes the world. So a key part of this community is featuring amazing, highly successful coaches like Adam. We've had lots of amazing enrollers. Um, kind of talk about how they approach enrollment um, and, and just spotlighting them basically and letting them teach and train and, and get to inspire people that come to these calls. So we're really excited you're here. And um, we are so excited today to host Adam. So for those of you who don't, who don't know Adam, I think a lot of you know Adam. Hi, Adam. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to be on on screen in this minute. Um, but for those of you who don't know Adam, he's an executive coach leading coaches and coaching leaders. He led an accomplishment coaching for five years. He's a committed stand for possibility and of miracles and breakthroughs in coaching. And he believes, as Jason and I do, that coaching rules. So, um, so yeah, um, I'll turn it over to you, Adam. The mic's all, all yours. We are very honored and pleased to have you today. Thanks, Casey. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everyone. For Oh, I'm big now. I'm going to reduce the size of my Zoom so I'm less intimidated by my, my visage. There we go. Uh, actually, I want to see if... Okay, there we go. I can put it in gallery view. That's less distracting for me. So <laughs> it's cool to hear um, you describe me, Casey, as like a successful coach because one, I notice there's always like this moving bar to it. And of course I work with my own coach and um, I'm like, yeah, I'm there, but I'm not here. And I get better at, at like starting to honor where I'm at in my process and just to see like all the ground I've covered and all of that. But it's, it's neat to hear that and to get this opportunity to notice like, oh yeah, there's that, that part of my survival mechanism or my ego that's always like, but once you're there, then things will be different. So that's the first thing that I kind of notice. Second thing I want to say is just, it's so cool to see so many familiar faces here on this call. Like 
Some of you I know from way back, like Tamir, it's great to see you. Some of you I see often, which is a great honor, like you can. Some of you I know kind of only through our relationship and Facebook, like yourself, Catherine. So it's just like, I'm really honored to see all of you and to get to connect with you this way. So cool. And a big, big, big thank you, Casey and Jason, for creating something like this and, and um, being the clearing in which we can have this conversation. Um, last thing I want to share by way of background is that when I got into coaching, I, my previous careers were um, software development and uh, basically I was a project manager in the last few years before I left that and then a uh, lawyer. And um, I remember kind of getting into coaching because I was like, fuck law, not that. Super interesting to study. All of these people seem like monochromatic in terms of their lives. They're very gray and life doesn't seem very pleasing and they keep Anytime I ask them how they feel about their jobs, their answer is always, well, here's the thing. And they're like, uh-oh. So I, I didn't, I got into coaching because I felt a call towards something, but there was also um, a call to leave something. And the reason I'm sharing this is because finding out that this was a path of entrepreneurial endeavor, you know, a path of creating clients, a path of enrolling people in something was terrifying to me. And that was so far the opposite of who I understood myself to be at that point in time. And if you had told the Adam of 12 years ago, just starting out on this journey, that he would then in 12 years time be leading a call about enrollment and about objections and about supporting people to step into working with you as a coach, he would have like, it wouldn't have been a very pleasing reaction you would have gotten from him. He would have sort of laughed and been like, that's cool. You were probably mistaken and whatever. So it's really a testament to me <laughs> to get to see that journey. It's a testament that um, enrollment's available to all of us. If I can get to the point where I'm really empowered around it, so can you. Now, you don't know me too well just yet. So you might be like, yeah, yeah, it's different for me than it is for Adam. But all the same, I want to share that as my way of starting out. So. The first thing that's going to happen on this call is I'm going to drink some water, which I'm going to do right now. It's a very detailed agenda I'm going to give you. Please be sure to smile when I tell jokes. That makes my jokes better. If you don't, the jokes become more desperate, and then it's really bad news for all of us. And I'm going to have a lot of fun on this call, so you might as well join me. So we're going to look at, we're going to do kind of three main um, components today. The first is I want to speak to the predominant context that exists for enrolling people into a coaching relationship and the consequences of that context. And then I want to create a new context for us to come from. So that'll be the first thing that we'll do. The second is once we've created that new context, we'll then um, get into working with someone who's got some objections, just working through that and rolling past the objections. Um, and then the third part of our conversation tonight is gonna be questions and answers, um, including your own objections to whatever we talk about. So it's easy sometimes on these calls to think, oh, I've got resistance to what is being shared, but I should just set that aside and just receive the wisdom. Don't do that. Your resistance is really, really, really valuable. Just like your client's resistance and objections to working with you is really, really, really valuable. So we wanna model this here. We wanna honor any resistance, any yeah, but what about, any how about if, or yeah, but are you even thinking about this? We wanna honor bringing that into the space because that's the gold, always. That's where the best learning can come from. And if you're willing to courageously bring it into the space, we can all kind of learn from that. So can I just see a show of hands that people are enrolled in that, that you're game to like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to share that. That's cool. Okay, great. And I, yes, excellent. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for coming on, Thomas, to give me the show of hands. Great. Okay. So, um, Casey, Jason, are people able to bring themselves off mute if I want them to, or do they? Okay, perfect. So I want to hear from, let me set something up first, and then I'm going to want to hear from people. So I would say that the predominant context we have for creating clients, for enrolling people in our client practice is one of sales. I'm going to sell people on coaching, blah, 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 blah. And there's fancy words for it that we come up with that don't 
quite sound the same as sales, but ultimately that's the predominant context. That's the context most of us have. It's the context that most of the world operates through is one of sales. And so just by way of starting out, I'd like to hear from four people. You can bring yourself off mute or you can raise your hand, whatever your preference is. But for people like, what does that mean to you? When you think of selling someone coaching or creating a client that way, what shows up for you? What does that mean to you? Yes, Heather. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it means being pushy and trying to get them um, somewhere I want them to be. So, you know, it's like, it's, it's a really yucky feeling and uh, foreign for many people because they haven't been in sales and salespeople have a bad reputation. <laughs> Got it. And I, I see you, Nadine, but I saw Kong. Is it Kong? Am I saying your name right? Yes. Great. Thanks, Heather. Kong, what do you have? I feel kind of shamed, actually. And I feel pushing and I feel not being myself. And I'm doing something totally not me and yes. uh, very uncomfortable. Thanks for sharing that. And, and when you say you feel ashamed, is it that you're sharing this that ashamed or just in general, when it comes to sales, you feel kind of ashamed? Uh, when I sell, trying to sell something to other people. Got it. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Nadine. I feel utterly terrified and I, and um, repelled because when I'm going to a store, if anybody tries to even approach me with, and I think that they have the intent on trying to sell me something, I, I politely already say, no, thank you. And I'm brand new to coaching and I'm a class, I'm a teacher, so I've never had the people were already there. <laughs> yes. It's a terrifying notion, but. Great. So I just want to acknowledge you, Nadine, for being more evolved than I am, because <laughs> I do everything you do, minus the politeness. Oh, so way to go. <laughs> I was taught to be nice and I teach my children, so I, I have to follow through. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Jason. Yeah, I was going to say for me, when I, when I go into the context of sales, that creates all this pressure on me. That now I have to deliver value. And it kind of takes the, it deflates like the excitement of the process for me. Got it. Yeah. It's kind of like you're on the hook. I got to show up. Got it. And Ken, did you, I saw your hand. Did you have anything you want to add? Yeah. I, you know, the word sales to me is some transaction that, that involves money. Like it could be anything, anything and in exchange for money. So for me, that word puts the focus on the money that I'm going to make rather than the thing that we're actually focusing on. Mm, great distinction. Thanks for bringing that. Great. So pretty common experience that we tend to have. Now, some of you may have a different relationship to the notion, the context of sales, and, and that's fine. It, this isn't about sort of imposing something, but broadly speaking, that's how most of us feel about sales. And the context of sales is sort of like the, you know, I'm a pushy, I'm a bother, I need to convince someone of something, I need to find some way to get them to want the thing that I have. Now, in this context, the best case scenario is when I come into contact with someone who already wants the thing that I want them to want. Everyone following me? The, the coaching profession is flooded with people trying to sell into that best case scenario. This is why if you go on LinkedIn and it's a fun experiment, you just change your title to coach and then people start jumping out of apartment buildings that are like, I can get you hot leads and they land on top of you. Your inbox fills up with these people. And that's because they're trying to provide you the best case scenario in this sales-based context for what we're up to. So what most people caught in this context try to do is, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to find hot leads because at least then I'm not pushing anything on people. I'm not doing all of that. And because I don't know where to find these hot leads, I'll hire a hot leads finder and then they'll bring them to me. That's the best case scenario. The second best case scenario that I find people tend to get into is one where they're like, okay, I recognize I might have to convince people or do like some salesmanship kind of stuff, but I know in the long run, 
that working with me is going to change their lives. So I can, I can do this gross thing in front of me in service of this awesome thing that's going to happen. Is anyone kind of in that state where they're like, okay, I'm willing to like wade through the mud because I know that there's whatever's a, a pool of ice cream on the other side of the mud. I don't know metaphors very well. So just hang in with, but you guys know what I mean, right? Great. So that's the game most of us are playing, which kind of sucks because at the very best, even if you get really empowered around this approach and you really see the value on the other side of that pool of mud, you're still committed to walking through a pool of mud at some point. And so then the game becomes how fast can I get us out of that pool of mud before we can go and walk in the golden Elysian fields that we really want to be walking in. So there's a bunch of stuff that we do around this. We try to find those hot leads. We try to convince people. We try to convince people that we don't want to convince them of anything. So then we get in those weird conversations you might find yourself in at a networking event where you're like, man, I really want to work with this person, but I, I don't want them to know that. So then you're trying to hide that fact, but that's fucking weird because now you're not being authentic to what's there. Can anyone relate to that experience? Okay, good. Not just me. The other thing that happens in this context is that when our clients are, when they have fear show up, it's significant. It really means something when our clients get afraid. And what it most likely means is that, oh, I'm pushing them into something. I'm being pushy. So what we tend to do from this place is as soon as the person has any kind of like resistance and because of our own story about what we're up to, we're hyper vigilant to it. As soon as we feel anything, we're like, drop everything, no worries, now's not the time, totally get it, call me in 12 years if anything changes, you know, or whatever it happens to be. Okay, I think I've trashed the predominant context enough, but I just want to check and see if there's anything else that I wanted to say about this. Um, there's not a lot of partnership in this. There's me over here with the thing that I want to give to you. There's you over there who may or may not want it. Hopefully you do. But if you're not sure, then there's some convincing I have to do at or onto you. <clears throat> and once we navigate and get through all of that, then we can get into the good stuff where we get to have partnership with people. Here's a new context, a different context for um, enrolling someone in your coaching practice. The new context is that someone entering into a coaching agreement with you is no different than them entering into any other project that you would support them on. It just so happens this project is called working, and hire, work, working with and hiring Adam. So I want to talk a little bit about that because that might sound a little magical at this point. So the first thing is as a coach, people work with you to create results that are not predictable for them. They create results through their work with you that exist in the field of possibility, the, the world of the unknown. Does everyone know what I'm talking about so far? Great. If people were like, I want to eat chicken three days a week, that doesn't require any breakthrough. There's no requirement on their part, presumably, to really make that happen. That's not the sort of results people hire a coach for. They hire coaches to work in their lives on creating results that currently seem a little bit impossible outside of their reach. So anytime people create a goal that exists in the realm of possibility, that also exists in the realm of the unknown. David, it looks like you're, I keep looking at him like, what is, oh, okay, there you go. You flipped right side up. I was like, is he sleeping? What is happening? Anyhow, I like it. It was endearing. <laughs> so anytime we create a goal in the realm of possibility, what's going to show up is also fear. And we know that's the case because they both exist in the unknown. The unknown is scary historically, because that's where the tiger was that ate us when we left the cave. And so we evolved this healthy fear of it. So anytime your client gets present to possibility, they're also going to get present to fear. Has anyone worked with a client where you had this conversation and they started to see like, oh my God, this is what's possible. And you started to work with them to create a vision. And they were like, this is amazing. And then next week, or maybe in two weeks, or maybe in a month's time, they're like, yeah, so I've been thinking about that. And I'm like, you know, life's not that bad. And actually, that idea is a bit crazy. And so maybe right now, what I need to do is just put some attention on the lemonade stand that I'm working at and like just find a way to really love what I'm... Has anyone had that experience with their client? <clears throat> so that's the nature of possibility, is that they see what's possible 
they start to take some kind of action towards it and then they get afraid. And then what their fear does is it convinces them, here's why where you are right now is amazing. And here's why that thing is a bit batshit crazy and do that in like a couple of years time or maybe infinity plus two more weeks or something like that. So it pushes it off. Everyone following me so far? Okay, awesome. So hiring you as a coach is no different from this. And in fact, I would assert that hiring a coach is, it's almost like the essence of stepping into the unknown. Because not only are they gonna work with you to do all of this stuff, to create projects, to create results that exist way out there in the unknown, they don't understand how that relationship's gonna work with you. They're afraid of what you might point out. They're afraid of how they'll do it wrong or all of that sort of stuff. So the very thought of hiring a coach is a huge step into possibility. It's a huge step into like their life changing dramatically once and for all. And so of course, what's gonna show up with that but fear? Everyone tracking me so far? So the way most of us work with this is inside that old context. So we start talking to someone about their lives, what they might want to create. And then we're like, okay, do you want to do this? And they're like, I totally want to do this. This sounds really cool. And we're like, okay, this is what it looks like. It costs $500 a month for three months minimum. It's a $1,500 price tag. And now all of a sudden that beautiful, fancy vision that they were working on with you, they're present to some of what it's going to cost them. And they go, uh, well, that's cool, but maybe let me think about it. And you know all of the reasons for why not right now show up. The way we be with clients in this moment, in that old context we talked about, is as though the client sat with us and was like, okay, Kong, I really, I'm present to this possibility. I really want to make it happen. It's going to be super cool. I can't wait. And you're like, great, that's really cool. And then they come back next week and they have these excuses for why not. And you're like, well, the project sounded cool, but you know, let me know get back into me in two years time and let me know if you want to do the project then. So it's almost like we just drop the floor out from underneath the client and we turn away and we turn away because we're afraid that we're going to be pushy and that we're going to be salesy. So it's that old context that has us actually drop our clients in the most sacred of places. Or can y'all see what I'm kind of speaking to here? Is there anyone, and this is a moment of courage, if it's the case for you, is there anyone that's lost or that's not following what I'm speaking to or that has a question in this moment about anything I've shared? Mm, I'm doing better than normal. It's a good sign. Caitlin, were you just about to put your hand up? Okay, great. <clears throat> so we can't see it because of our old context, but what we're actually doing is we're dropping the client and the opportunity to serve the client when their objections show up is actually the most sacred of moments for us as coaches. That's the moment when we get to model for the client what it's gonna be like to work with us, all the love, all of the unattachment, all of the support in partnership with their fear as it shows up before they've paid us a cent, before they've paid us even a dime. That's amazing. If you take a moment to really let that sit in, like, holy cow, I get to stand for my client to be able to have what they want. So one of the ways we drop that stand we have for the client is they, we say it's going to cost $1,500, three months of work. I'm, I'm deliberately, by the way, choosing a low rate. For some of you, that won't feel like a low rate. But almost anyone could create $1,500 if there was something they really wanted to create for $1,500. If your car broke down and you need a new car, you could create that $1,500. So one of the ways we drop that stand for that client's vision is they say, ah, $1,500, what about $300? And we go, yeah, yeah, I could work with you for $300. Which would be like if the client was like, this is the project I have, and this is what I want to do, and this is how amazing it's going to be. And they go and look, and they're like, oh, I see it's going to require that. And then they go, okay, instead of that being the project, I'm just going to like, and then they give you this weak, watered down version of the vision, where it doesn't have any of the magic. And then we're like, okay, great, let's just do that. So we drop the stand for the client. We reduce our rates so that the client never has to really confront their fear. And consequently, we never have to confront our own fear. Our fear of being with someone else's fear. So it's important at this moment that I share, it, is, it generates fear for us to sit with fear. 
when someone else gets scared, that will trigger our fear. So what you're doing when you're sitting with a client and being with their objections, their fear is going to come up. They're afraid. They're afraid of this commitment. They're afraid of what will happen in their lives. They're present to possibility, but they're also present to fear screaming in their ear. And as we sit with them, our fear shows up. Our fear showing up isn't very significant. It's natural. It's normal. It's healthy. We're in the unknown with the client. We don't know how this conversation is going to go. We don't know what's going to happen. Are we going to do it right? Are we going to fail? So we get afraid. And then once we make our fear significant, that's when it has us. So our job to some extent is to let ourselves be afraid and just be like, oh, hello, old friend. Here you are. I'm just going to let you hang out with me while I sit with this person and their fear. Okay. Everyone tracking so far? Awesome. Let me have a drink of water and see if there's anything I'm missing. So I'm going to talk about the components we want on the table. Then I'll talk about what we're going to do. And then we'll shift into me working with someone where we just role play that. And we model that. <clears throat> so first and foremost, we need something on the table that the client wants to create in their lives. Right? This is probably something a lot of the other speakers, if you've been to any of these events before, have talked about. There has to be some reason that people want to work with you, aside from, I want to work with Adam because I like him. That's cool. I'm very likable. But that's a terrible reason for someone to really take on their lives, to really confront their fear. There's nothing in it for them other than this idea of working with me. So the first thing we want to make sure that we've got on the table is, what for? What does this person really want in their life? This is what we call possibility. Everyone familiar with this notion to some extent? Perfect. So if we don't have that, it's kind of hard because people aren't really enrolled in much at all in their lives. Once you've got that possibility, then it's sort of like we give them a demonstration of coaching. We ask them, are you interested in more of this? Would you like this? And they're like, yeah, I really want this. Great. Here's what it costs. We share that with them. And then our job is to sit with them and see what happens. Two things typically happen. There's actually three. So the first one is that the person's like, cool, I'm in. We love those. Those are the best case scenario, right? They're like, let's just do it. I'm going to write you a check right now. Let's make it happen. More often, there's two other approaches. One is they're like, yeah, I really want to do this, but mm, I've got some stuff in the way. So that's the yes, but. I lied. There's four scenarios. The third scenario is where people are like, I don't want this. If people say that they don't want this, then we honor their no. So if they're clear, I'm not interested in this. Thanks for your time. You're awesome. I really appreciate it. But I'm actually not interested in more of this. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for doing this work with me. It's been a treat. Let me know if there's ever any way we can, I can support you. So this is how we ensure that we're not being pushy. And you're going to see this as a thread woven throughout this as we go forward, is we always check in with the client to see, do you want more of this? So would you like, are you interested in knowing what it's like to work together? No, I'm good. Awesome. Thanks so much. We always honor that when it shows up. So the, third, the second scenario I mentioned is, yeah, I'd like to, but the fourth scenario is a little sneakier. And that's where the person says they don't even blink at your rates and they just say, totally, let's do it. I'm not. And they, they kind of go kind of numb. Has anyone had this where someone sort of they said yes, but there was something about their yes that felt a bit weird for you. And then they quit a month later, or you send them their first invoice and they're like, actually, no. Has anyone had that experience yet? Okay, great, a couple of you. So what's happening there is the person has objections, they have fears, but they're, they're trying to overcome their fear by doing this and like running off the edge of the diving board. So it's like, if I don't acknowledge my fear, if I just run straight off, then I'll get into this commitment and then I'll, be, then I'll be good. And we as coaches, because we're scared, we hear the yes and we're like, great, I'll call you next week after I sent the invoice. See you later, click. Get me off the fucking phone immediately because this is terrifying. So both of those situations, the one where the person's a yes but or the per where the person is a yes and there's absolutely no buts and let's just do this straight away. The thing that's required from us is some metal, some willingness, some courage to sit with that person's fear, to call forward their fear so that we can be with it. Just like if we were supporting them with a project 
And they were like, I'm going to triple my profits and I want to work half as much. And we were like, great. And what do you see might be in the way of that? What might be scary? And they say, nothing at all. I can't wait. You'd probably be like, yo, know, come on. Really? Nothing? Seems like you might be stepping over some stuff. Everyone tracking? Great. So in either of these cases, the yes, but, or the, did someone have a question there? I heard someone come off mute for a moment. Yeah. I, <clears throat> could you say that last sentence or two again? I just missed the last. Sentence or two. Uh, what would do you remember what I was talking about? It's okay. Mm. I haven't been paying attention yeah. either. <laughs> so let me let me do my best. So in either situation, what is required from us as a coach is a willingness to be with someone's fear. As they step into the coaching relationship with us, they're gonna get scared. And it requires a willingness on our part to stand for that person to bring their fear into the space and to talk about it. Because that's part of the magic of coaching. It's not that we support people to never have fear. That would be nonsense. That would be unhealthy. It's that we support them to learn how to partner with their fear, to bring their fear into the light of day so they can look at it and that they can choose to take the action even though their fear's there. Is that kind of what I had said, David? Well, I understood that. So yeah, I, that made it a little clear. Okay. Put it in the chat. If something comes forward, if you want any more clarification, just put it in the chat and we'll come back to it. Okay. I see your hand, Amanda. Yeah. Thanks. I'm still, I'm processing the sitting with the fear and thinking yes. about when and how you do that. So maybe stealing the thunder of what comes next. But if I think about a coaching session when you're sitting with someone and, and sitting with the fear and, and exploring with them, but what does that look like when you have, you don't have that same dialogue, you don't have that same opportunity to, to do that. You're not in like a, you're not sat in there talking about it. So what yeah. does that mean? So let's imagine have you ever had that version of the person that's like, yes, I'm in. And then they, you send them an invoice and they vanish. Has that ever happened for you? No, but I've had the one where they're, yes, they're in, send me more information. So you want to be in the dialogue talking to them, but you then end up getting into an exchange of emails or messages rather than being able to talk to them about it. Yeah. So that's, that's brilliant. I love that you use that as an example. So that's another one, right? Send me more information. I'm totally into this, but send me more information. That's kind of like, I'm totally into this, but let's delay things a little bit. And if what we're talking about is this person creating the result that they are clear is like the thing they really want in their life, it's kind of weird to be like, yes, I totally want this, but it's not weird if we understand, oh, they're just afraid. But if, if we didn't look at that, it's a weird thing for someone to be like, this is what I wanted all my life. Let me think about it for another year. That would be weird, right? So when someone gives us a, yeah, I, I'm totally down with this, but give me more information. One, we want to kind of consider, oh, there might be some fear showing up. That's a possibility. We don't have to point to that yet, but we want to bring curiosity to what's happening, knowing that might bring fear into the space. And so the way we would bring curiosity is, okay, sure. What, what is the information you're looking for? And what are you hoping that that will provide? I'm not pushing them in any direction. I'm just asking the next curious question. Oh yeah, sure. It sounds like you really want this, but there's some information. So why don't we just work with that right now while I can support you rather than pushing it off? So that would be a way where we're inviting their fear to come up and be spoken. Does that make sense? It does. I like that question. What are you hoping it will provide? Yeah. Now, a lot of us are going to avoid that again because of the old context about sales. Mm -hmm. In sales, when I ask you, what are you hoping that's providing? I'm going to then use that as leverage to force you to do something I want you to do. In this new context of I'm here to support you succeeding in a project that you have underway, I'm not asking that question to force them to do something. I'm asking that question so I can see what's actually going on and what might be getting in the way for this person. Mm. You're doing okay. it from a place of help rather than trying to convince them otherwise brilliantly put that's exactly right so we are now remember whenever we change a context we've got ties that pull us back to that old one so mm -hmm. 
it requires a willingness, kind of some trust on our part to like, nope, I'm going to choose this new way of relating to what I'm doing, as opposed to, ah, I feel like I might be trying to push someone. You know, you're not. It's not why you're asking this question. You're asking to support them with the project. Okay. So once we start to ask these questions, eventually we're going to find out what's in the way for them. Well, I'd like to, it's just that that's a lot of money. Or I'd like to, but I'm worried about the time. Or I'd like to, but. So what we want to do is one, seek permission to support them always. This is how, again, remember, we don't force people. We aren't convincing or cajoling or tricking someone. So we say, oh, I really got that. So you want to do this, but $1,500 currently seems like a lot of money. And you're not sure if you can afford that. Do I have that right? If they say, yeah. Then we say, got it. Would you like some support with that? What I do is I support people in projects where they see something they want. They see things in the way. They can't necessarily in the moment figure out how to move it out of the way. And I support them to shift that so they can create what they want now instead of waiting two, three, four, five, six, whatever years. Would you like some support with this? And if they say no, is anyone off mute? No one's off mute. If they say no, we go, great. Thank you so much for your time. This has been a pleasure. Let me know if I can ever support you. So again, we always honor the no. And if they say yes, awesome. They are a yes to you supporting them with this project that they're working on. Everyone tracking still? Great. So now we are engaged in a partnership with them. And here's where it gets cool to me. And this is where we're going to start to transition fairly soon here. So whatever the thing is that's getting in their way, we want to recognize and hold sort of as a context for ourselves that this is not unique to this project. So if money is a thing getting in the way here, you can pretty much guarantee money is also the thing getting in the way over there. And it's also the thing getting in the way with that project there and this project down here. If it's time, they're worried that they won't have enough time, you can pretty much guarantee that time is the thing getting in the way of having the dating relationship and the life that they really want. And time is the reason that they just don't seem to be able to have the fun social times that they really want to have in their life and so on and so forth. So we're relating to whatever the objection is as not particular to this project, but rather particular to this person. Everyone tracking that? We do that because that's the heart of coaching. The heart of coaching is that we're coaching the person and it's the way the person is being that gets in their way, not the circumstances of whatever it is that they're up to. Now, that way of being will look like the circumstances, but we're going to hold in the back of our mind, ah, got it. This person, it's money that seems to get in the way. Everyone tracking with me? Great. I'm going to really quickly talk about what we're going to do and then we're going to model it. How am I doing, Casey? Am I, is this... Okay, excellent. There's a, okay, cool. So let me just check in. And Adam, do you mind if I just source Not at you? All. real quick? So um, of the four people who said there's, they're in objections conversations, we're going to have an opportunity for Adam to role model how he would support you with those. So I'm curious, does any one of those four of you want to be in that conversation? Like, do you, do you want to be getting coached on the other side, playing your clients, basically, your potential clients? I, I would love to be. I, I just want to be careful. I do have a limited, I need to leave at eight o'clock, but I would love to be. Okay, we've yeah. got a couple, couple yes. So Kristen and Will. Any con okay, did any of the four original voluntolds want to do it? Because I want to give them first priority. So Jean, Ian, oh, Will and Kristen. Okay, um, how are we going to tie break? Hello? I vote Kristen. Will, <laughs> I appreciate you volunteering. I really do. And yeah. I want to make sure that we're, you know, not, not having to stop. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So before we, I, I talk about kind of the next piece, have I left anyone behind? And what we've described in this notion of these two contexts, the stepping in, is there anyone that's sort of like, I'm lost? Cool, sharp group. Is there anyone that would not say that they're lost because they're embarrassed that they're lost? Okay, Catherine. But I'm is not that lost, the case? But that is the kind of thing I would do. <laughs> Great. Thanks for putting your hand up. Awesome. 
My dog's going to come join us for this. We'll close that door. Okay. So, in terms of a way, uh, in terms of like a thing happening in someone's life, um, I want to give a, 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 a sort of rough overview of how uh, we create the world around us. So, there's kind of three parts. For any particular thing in our life, we establish a set of beliefs about it. So we can have beliefs about, say, money, like a belief that to make a lot of money, you have to work hard. Anyone present to that belief? Anyone know that one? Great. From a belief, we are going to act in a certain way. If we really believe that to make a lot of money, you have to work hard, then we're going to dismiss looking at jobs that promise a lot of money without a lot of hard work. We're going to be like, that's obviously a scam. We're going to naturally look for and excel in jobs that reward us for working very hard and make, and then they'll pay us a bunch of money for doing that. Everyone tracking me so far? When people tell us about their job and how they get to make a lot of money without working very hard, we're going to listen through a skeptical lens because we know, based on our belief, that that doesn't actually exist. It's too good to be true. And so on and so forth. So we've got a set of beliefs about anything. And then we've got the actions we take as a result of those beliefs. Everyone following me so far? The actions we take in alignment with our beliefs create a world around us that is consistent with those actions. So I'm naturally going to find myself in a job where you are paid to work very hard and you get a lot of money for it. And I'm going to be surrounded by people that agree with that. And I'm probably not going to have a lot of friendships with people that make a lot of money without working very hard because I'm going to relate to those people as cheats and scammers. Who knows what they're going to do? Who knows where they're getting that money? Maybe, they're, maybe that's the reason I don't ever seem to have as much money as I want. So our beliefs guide our actions. Our actions then create a world around us that's consistent with that. Everyone still tracking? Cool. Here's the cool part. The world around us now reinforces our beliefs and proves their truth. So if you go to your client, your prospect, this amazing human that's you soon to take on the possibility of their lives. And you say, tell me about what's in the way. And they say, I really want to work with you, but $1,500 is too much. And then you start to listen to their beliefs about money. And they're like, I just know, blah, 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 blah. If you try to tell them that's just a story you've made up, it's not true. On one level, it's true because it is their beliefs, but they've created a world around them that is a concrete reflection of that belief. So it is a story but that story has also been born out into reality. They have surrounded themselves with a reality that's consistent with that story. Everyone tracking me here? So our beliefs actually create reality and then reality recreates our beliefs and so on and so forth. So when we're gonna look at this with this person, what we wanna be doing is helping them see that pattern. That's our goal when we're supporting people with objections. It's not to overcome their objections. It's not to shatter their beliefs. It's simply to help them see the world they've created and how it makes true these beliefs and an opportunity to see what a breakthrough looks like. I'm going to walk us through that, but that's what we're actually trying to do. We're not trying to fix it for them. So let's say we have someone and they're like, ah, $1,500 is a lot of money. I'm concerned about that. So we want to know, okay, great. Tell me about money. Tell me about how money goes. Tell me about the stories about money. And they're going to tell us that. And then we want to know, great, what are the actions you take as a result of these beliefs you have about money? And they're going to tell us, well, I do this and I don't do that. And I do this and I don't do that. Great. What does that make impossible in your life from these beliefs and these sets of actions? Well, I could never do this. I could never have that. Great. And can you see how that reinforces the beliefs? Yes. And then from there, we can take the next step. I'm going a little bit quick because what I want to do now is step into it with Kristen so that we can actually work through this and you'll see it in the moment. So Kristen, are you ready to jam with me? Yeah. You'll have to come off mute to do so. Yeah, sorry. My okay. um, Zoom froze for a second and the mute, like the whole bottom bar disappeared. So I was like, where did it go? <laughs> Got caught in the mute loop. Yeah. <laughs> I have a mute on this headset and then one in Zoom. And sometimes I get like, it's very funny for everyone but me. Okay. Adam, before yes. we do that, Kristen, 
Could you set the stage for all of us so we know who this client is, what it is that you see in working with them, and what where you currently are in the process? Of course. So um, this is a new client. She wants to work with me uh, to work on romantic relationship healing and finding a life partner. She already um, did my tiny offer. So we had a 90 minute conversation that really mapped out her soul aligned partner and all of the characteristics that would make her relationship um, a true match. And we also looked at patterns of self-abandonment and things like prior to that, which has had her not choose the characteristics that she really needs in that partner. So she just said that conversation, because she's hired other dating coaches in the past, and that just like opened up a whole other level for her of like really looking at how she hasn't been choosing herself. Um, she's a multi preneur. Um, so she has zero money objections to working with me. She's just really scared of what's going to come up emotionally um, and delving into some of the topics that have come up in the course of us corresponding with one another. Um, just another background. I worked in mental health 10 years before becoming a coach. Um, I do, I'm trained in trauma-informed coaching. She works with a therapist. She has a lot of trauma. Um, so I'm aware of like the trauma in her background, but I think she's just scared of, she knows she needs a coach to do more proactive step, steps and looking, but I think she's also scared of what's going to come up. Cool. Do you, may I, Jason? Great. Thank you. Um, do you feel comfortable, Kristen, like embodying your client as we work through this? I do. Yeah. Okay, cool. You don't have to imitate their voice or anything, although it would be funny, <laughs> but this will be great. And cool. I love that we've got something that's a little unique from a money objection or a time objection. And for everyone, the objection, the, the content of the objection, whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's my family, doesn't matter. It will seem like it matters, but what we are interested in when we're supporting people in this way is helping them see the pattern that they've created, how that pattern shows up everywhere in their life, and that there's an opportunity for a breakthrough here in hiring you. It doesn't matter if it's time, money, emotions, whatever. So that's what we're going to work through. So I just sorry, wanted Kristen. to add real quickly, there is a bit of a time objective that she also has just because she's a multi or like I said, she's juggling a lot. Um, and I think she's a, a afraid that with all of her ventures, her, the emotional things that will come up will mess up how much time she has. So there is like kind of that sneaky time objective in there too. Got it. Okay. Perfect. So multi, she's multi about everything. Yeah. <laughs> multi in her objections too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, let me check and see if there's anything I want to add. Okay, so um, one in advance, Kristen, I apologize if I call you Kirsten. There's something about my brain and those two names that I'm sure you get it plenty. Kristen, Kristen, Kristen. So it's totally fine if you do. I, great. I won't be upset. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, so it sounds like you're clear on what's available down this path that, you know, you've described it like a romantic relationship, the romantic relationship you want, the relationship of your dreams, a forever relationship. Like there is some skin in the game for you in terms of what you want. Is that, do I have that right? That's correct. Great. And I just realized I need to put one more piece in here for everyone. So let me pause this for a sec. We are going to operate with the assumption that Kristen's client or prospect or whatever is whole and complete and that their trauma is not going to get in the way. Trauma, and indeed, some of Kristen's training can actually make it a little more complicated in some ways. And um, that's not to detract from any of it, but just for the sake of what we're working with here, we're going to start with the foundation. She's whole and complete, so we don't have to worry about managing trauma or anything like that. Okay. So Kristen, you're clear on what you want. And, and let's, just to make this real for you, Kristen, like what would be... No, I don't want to go there. We're not going to worry about price. So 
there's this possibility of working together. And it sounds like, you know, after our work together, you'd like more of this. Do I have that right? Yes. Okay. Okay, cool. And I hear that there's some stuff possibly in the way, some fear, some concern that might be showing up. Yes. Okay. And I know you mentioned there's like time and then there's like, you know, this concern about like emote, like what am I going to have to face or confront? What will the emotions be? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And are there any others that I haven't, that we haven't got onto the table so far? That's it. Okay. Really okay. Great. Emotions and like derailing her timeline. Great. And I want to invite you to own it. Like just be her. Okay. For this. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you'd officially started. So we have. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So which of those two feels kind of like the most prominent? Like, I don't want to diminish either of them, but which feels kind of the most biggest? The emotions, definitely. I don't want to be taken out with everything I have going on right now. Got it. So everyone, what we're going to start by doing is just getting Kristen to like share all of that. We want her to put it into the space. So Kristen, tell me about that. Like, tell me about the emotional concern. Well, I'm a problem solver. So once I know something is in the space, I tend to become hyper fixated on it till the Mm. end. So with everything I have going on, I'm afraid I'm going to become obsessed with attachment theory and like my relationship with my mom and everything else that we discussed. And it's going to make me really emotional and it's going to derail everything I have going on in my life right now. And a lot of people are relying on me. Like I have a big, just big staff. There's deadlines, the launches that are happening. Like I can't really just get like fucked up right now. Mm. Mm. So it sounds like there's a bit of a concern as we start to go towards creating what you want. It's going to drive up some stuff that's going to get you fucked up and it's going to derail stuff. You'll get fixated on it, attached to it, obsessed with it. Do I have that right? Yeah. I, uh, I'm really afraid that's going to happen. Thanks for owning that. I can relate to that. Okay. Anything, any, anything else about your concerns emotionally of what might happen or might not happen? Honestly, I'm just afraid there isn't a person out there for me. Like that's Mm. a big fear I have that I might do all this work just only to find that there really isn't someone for me. Mm. So it's like, check my feet. I don't want to put something in there that's not accurate for you, but I I can almost imagine that sort of like, I'm going to do all this work. I'm going to get fucked up. All of this is going to happen only to discover there's not actually someone there for me. Shit. Why did I do all that work? Is that accurate? Yeah. Got it. That makes sense. (laughs) Sounds like you're quite a intelligent person. Like (laughs) if that was true, that there wasn't someone there, it would make a lot of sense not to, you know, not to go towards that. Let me pause and speak to them. So I'm going to, I'm going to pause us at times. So everyone just notice how much sense this stuff makes. And that, remember, we talked about beliefs to actions, to environment or world back to beliefs, your client's objections make complete sense in their context in the frame in which their life operates. And so we want to be really cautious about sort of like, well, that's just made up. Of course, there's someone out there. That's not the reality that this person currently operates within. So what we want to bring to our client's objections is what I call reverence. We want to hold what they're sharing the same way we would hold it if God or whoever you are inspired by brought it to us. We'd be like, oh, wow, I really want to look at that and honor it. Okay. So Kristen, I've got so far hyper fi- I'm c- concerns about becoming hyper fixated, obsessed, attachment theory, all of that. It'll derail everything. You'll get fucked up and or you'll do all that for not, there's not any cheese down that tunnel. Anything else? I think, yeah, I just, I think it's more like if that person's really out there, if I'm just too much, um, Mm. yeah, sometimes it just feels like nothing I've done up until this point has worked. 
Got except, it. I guess, except seeing what came up in our conversation was that everything that I actually really need, I haven't been choosing and I haven't realized that up until this point. So then I thought maybe things could actually be different. Cool. So there's like a glimmer of possibility, but then there's also like a bunch of black fear that's like, yeah, but what if, what if that person isn't out there? Or I, the last one I heard is sort of like, or what if they're out there and you're just not up to it? Like you'll do all this work and that's not going to be enough. And then where's that going to leave you? Is, do I hear that right? Yeah. I mean, I like to think I'm a hopeful person. I mean, that's mm -hmm. why I reached out to you to begin with and had our conversation because I do think there's that special person out there and that I can have, you know, all of, all my business dreams already came true. So why, and I created that myself. So why can't I create a relationship? Like by that logic, I created something that I didn't think was possible in that realm. So I like to yeah. think I could do the same thing with a relationship. Totally got that. So I hear there's this belief, even a desire you have, or even a desire to believe, or, you know, we could draw this a number of different ways. And am I correct in hearing that in addition to your belief, your hopefulness, that there is some fear that's like, yeah, and maybe not. Is that accurate? Yeah. I mean, I feel like there's just new pains that could come up because yeah. of how well you see me and that scares me. Totally got that. So let me pause here. So for everyone notice what happened is super common, which is the fear showed up, which was like, what if you do all this work and it doesn't work? Then where are you going to be? You're extra fucked. At least here, you're not exposed, vulnerable, fucked up, derailed. And yeah, that person's out there, but you know, you know, sometime down the road, you can do it. But the fear is kind of like, what if you do all of that stuff and that person shows up and then rejects you? That's going to be even worse. Oh my goodness. And then what happened was our client had sort of like, but I'm a hopeful person and I believe. So what's happening is they're trying to like lessen their fear. There, did I need to see gallery so I can see nodding heads. Did everyone see that as it happened? So that's the part that all of us do. We don't want to give our fear rain. We're worried that if we give our fear rain, then it's going to like run free. It's going to make it true. Blah, blah, blah. And so we try to push our fear down. I don't want to look at that. So as we're doing this, it's requiring courage on the part of our client. And, and even I would venture Kristen just to channel this, to allow our fear to be in the space without shutting it down. So we want to honor that. We want to acknowledge that in ourselves. And at times we may want to really honor our client just for like having the courage to let that fear have a voice, just like they're letting their hopefulness have a voice. Okay. Let me uh, view speaker. Yes. Okay. Learning how to use Zoom. Very, very professional over here. Okay. Um, okay. And then there's this, you know, Adam, Kristen, you, I see you very well. And, and what is that going to bring up? And I imagine that feeds back into the same stuff. Will I become hyper fixated, obsessed? Is there anything other than that that we haven't caught as far as the fear, the concerns? Um, I know you have a four month container and a six month container. And based off our initial assessment, um, you thought I'd be a better fit for the six month, but six months just seems like such a long amount of time. And I'm not sure if I can commit to that off the bat. Got it. And that would also make sense to me. Like if with, sorry, what was the other one, Kristen, three months, there's a four and a six month Four. okay. So if with four months, there's all this concern, fuck, I'm going to get fucked up. Who knows? Will it work? Blah, blah, blah. Six months would be, why put yourself through six months? Why even go further than that? So that makes complete sense. Okay. Any other stuff that we haven't gotten on the table? I think that's it. 
Awesome. So one, thank you for sharing that. Thanks for letting me see you. Thanks for being willing to put it into the space. Thanks for the incredible courage it requires just to even speak to our fear. As we know, when there's a monster under your bed, you don't be a crazy person and put your head under the bed and look at it. You go to the hardware store, you buy plywood and then like metal fencing and stuff. And you put that over the bed so you never have to look at it. So thanks for being a crazy person. Thanks for being willing just to speak that fear into the space. Great, great work. So for everyone, we'll just pause for a sec. What we've done is we've had the client put all of her stuff into the space. All her fears are now in the space. And if you're noticing a desire in you to like explain why that's not the case or why she doesn't have to worry about that, or don't you worry, I'm going to hold you, but I'm going to see you in a particular way or any of that sort of stuff. That's all of our response to letting the client just be afraid with whatever is scary for her. So we want to set that aside. That's not our work. Our work is to let the client speak this into the space, honor the courage that requires and get it. So the way we get it is we don't object to it. We don't tell her why that's not going to be the way it's going to be. We don't tell her, you don't have to worry about that. We really get it in a sense that, wow, that makes sense. And as you give the client the experience of being gotten, what that does is it releases their need to hang on to it. When we try to convince the client, you don't have to be afraid of that. They go, yes, I fucking do. And I'm going to hold on to this even tighter. Okay. So we've got this set of like kind of beliefs hyper fixated, obsessed, attachment, derail, I'll get fucked up. There isn't going to be someone, I might turn someone away. Thanks for putting those out there, Kristen. So given these concerns, I imagine this isn't the only place in your life where that sort of fear has shown up. Would that be accurate? Probably not, but I feel like this is the only place I can identify right now. I just want to make sure I caught your language. I asked, would it be accurate? This isn't the only place. And you said, probably not. Like, yes, there's probably other places or no, this is the only place. There probably is other places, but I don't know where they are because I feel like I have everything else handled. Got it. So we'll pause there. There's two places we can go with people. One is they're like, nope, this only happens here. This is the first time ever. And so as a coach, we want to get really curious about that. That's weird when something for the first time ever in someone's life is showing up. We don't want to make it wrong. We just want to be like, oh, that's fascinating. What do you imagine has this be the one place in your life where this is the thing? And almost always it's because people are attached to something. They're resisting something. It's very rare in someone's life, once they're past like the age of 12, that you're in a conversation with them about their fear. And there's like a brand new way that fear has never shown up before. It's not very effective for fear. What's effective for fear is like, I got these tools, I'm going to keep using them. And I'm going to get better and better and better at using them. In this instance, Kristen, you've shared probably, but I don't know where else. So I'm going to assume like normally, I would work with you a little bit to sort of like, where do you think it might be? We draw that out a little bit. And the intention would be to help our clients see this isn't just specific to working together. This happens in a relationship with their last boyfriend. And it actually happened in a relationship with their mom. And it happened over there in a relationship with their child. Got it. And what we're doing is we're supporting the client to see how this isn't a thing specific to working together. It's a thing specific to their life and some of the stuff they're up to in their life. Everyone following? Great. I can only see four of you. So the four people I can see are following. The rest of you, I have no idea. So Kristen, let's assume that you were able to see that. Okay. So what do you do? What do you do to mitigate, to deal with the problem in your life when you feel like, ah, I'm concerned, I'm going to get hyper fixated. I'm going to get obsessed. I'm going to get attached to it. How do you deal with that? I shelf it. Shelf it? Okay. Yeah. Um... You know, there are so many things I can control in my life and those are so much easier to focus on. Mm. So I handle that and, you know, this just goes on the back burner for a bit. Mm. Got it. So shelf it, back burner. I like we were getting different locations in the pantry and the kitchen. <laughs> control stuff, I heard, and put your attention on what can be controlled rather than this other nebulous unknown stuff. Is that right? Well, you yeah. Cause you can't control other people. Like I 
I have no idea once I take on this dating work, like even if I heal, like who I'm going to meet and how that's going to all pan out. Right. So notice everyone, we're starting to hear about the actions that she takes as a result of her fears. Because she's afraid of this unbottling and whatever, she goes towards control, set it aside, blah, 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 do all that sort of stuff. Okay, great. So these currently sound like pretty good strategies. If I don't know, you know, if you don't know what's going to happen, if it's a big nebulous, if you can't control people, put your attention on what you can control, live a controlled life. Okay. What other strategies do you see? I saw a smile on your face, so I'm going to know whatever that one was. That one sounds good. Oh, I think you muted yourself. Sorry. I was just laughing because yeah, controlling things has just made me a lot of money. So, I mean, mm. that's one positive. Yeah. But so make more money. Sounds like another strategy. Yeah. 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 And that makes sense. Like it would, I could see how these would really serve someone to succeed and thrive in their life. So we'll pause for everyone. Your client's strategies may well be serving them. In fact, almost certainly that's why they were created in the first place. Okay. How about this fear? Like, uh, what if there isn't someone there after all that work? How do you deal with that concern currently? Um, I don't know. Like I just hang out with my friends, watch sad movies, cry, eat Oreos, masturbate. Mm, this sounds like an amazing life. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So in that, I kind of heard, don't go out seeking the person, stay with your friends. They're a known quantity, self-pleasure, food, sex, whatever, kind of like meet your own needs. And so at least it's not all gray. It's not all glum. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And anything else you can see? Not really. Great. For everyone watching, sometimes you'll have to work with your client to support them to draw more of this out. Like some people are like, oh, I've got those fears. There's nothing I do. Of course, there's something they do. We don't just let fear run its course. We live our lives so as to manage our fear. That's what most humans do. That's kind of the human condition. So we just want to, this is where we work with our client to draw this out of them. Okay. I could imagine I might do something like this. Do you have any strategies like this? There must be something you've learned to do. How do you deal with the issue of never meeting someone, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, so now we're, we've got some core concerns, some beliefs, some fears. We've drawn out some actions. Now we want to look at the world that that creates. And specifically, we want to get curious about what is impossible as a result of these beliefs and these actions. What will never come into this person's life? And what that does is helping us support the client in seeing the limits of the world she's created around her. Everyone tracking? All right. So Kristen, I get it. There's, you know, this concern. If I, if I open that chest, all of this stuff's going to come out. I'm going to get obsessed, fixated, kind of who knows what's going to happen. I'll get fucked up. Stuff will derail. There isn't going to be anyone anyhow, or even if there is, I might turn them away. And so as a result, we've got some pretty good strategies on the table. Shelf it, control, put attention on it, put attention on making money, maybe even try to find satisfaction through making money, even though you didn't say that one. And hang out with friends, eat Oreos, masturbate, watch sad movies. I don't know if that's the order that that happens. What is the consequence of that stuff? So what's the life that you end up left in? Well, I'm alone or like there's no one significant that I actually want to spend time with. Mm. Um, no shared vacations. Like I want to have fancy vacations with a partner. Mm -hmm. I want to create a partner that's my best friend. And I want the option of if I want to have a family, like to have one. And if I don't, that's cool too. And I'll just travel more with my partner or like whatever we create. So mm. I really want that person. 
what do you settle for instead of, so that person is not possible, I'm hearing you say, so what do you settle for instead? Well, I've been purposely single for a bit because I got tired of the dating scene. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I feel like I've dated people in the past where I've had to diminish my accomplishments um, just didn't get to be the fully expressed version of myself and like didn't have a fulfilling sex life. Like it was just, it was just like very mediocre. Mm. So for everyone, what happened there was Kristen just did another thing that'll sometimes happen as we're looking at what's the world that gets created. What's not possible in this life. She mentioned another strategy she does which is when she's around people, because she doesn't believe that that person might be out there, she diminishes herself. If you think that you sharing yourself is going to fuck you up and that there's not really a person out there or you'll turn them away, that's a strategy that makes a lot of sense. I'll show up half myself with people. At least that way they either turn away because I was showing up halfway and I'm in control or why would I show myself anyhow? There's not really that person. There's some brilliance to these strategies. And I hear part of what you settle for is like being single, kind of like, yeah, I'm okay with being single. It sounds like you're not devastated, but you're kind of like settling for it. Is that accurate? Yeah, I almost feel like I'm used to it at this point, but that's just because I was tired of all the people I was dating. Yeah, so it's better than dating shitty people that you don't like, but it doesn't really sound like, it's sort of like, the least worst option. It's kind of how it sounds. Yeah. Got it. And, and I also hear there's sort of like settling for shitty sex, you know, like that's okay. I can't find the one that would really keep up with me. That would be all this, but I could, I could, I can settle for that. Got it. So we've got this concern about what might come up. And as a result, of that concern, we've got shelf it, control it, put it on the back burner, wait until another time, set it aside for now, put your attention back on the stuff you know makes money, put your attention on being by yourself, managing your own needs, providing yourself pleasure, sex, food, you know, that sort of stuff. You got friends and it sounds like it's not a bad life, it's just not really a great life either. It's kind of like a seven, maybe an eight out of 10 life. Is that accurate? Yeah. I mean, I feel, I feel like I do have a lot of blessings and I have so much to be grateful for, Yeah. but there's the possibility of more, or I see people that have what I want. And then I just wonder why I can't, haven't been able to create that. Yeah. That makes total sense. So I acknowledge you for everything you have created. I really want to let that in. This is not about how you've done stuff wrong. This is not about like, look how crappy your life is. I really get that's not who you are. You're not looking at this like in misery. In fact, you're kind of empowered in the almost pretty good, not bad at all life most people would kill for. And I just hear there's a part for you that's like that you long for, a yearning that is missing. Is that right? Yeah. Got it. And can you see that from that fear of like emotionality of what might come up, blah, 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 and the actions you've learned to take, put it on the shelf, control it, set it aside, focus back on something else. Can you see that that thing is also happening here in the coaching? That's the same thing in the way with the coaching, sort of like, ah, what's going to come in the coaching? I'll set that aside. I'll shelf it. I'll put it on the back burner. I'll put my attention on like making money, pleasing myself, doing the stuff that I know to do. Can you see that? I'm not sure if I can totally. Cool. Well, let's look at it. What would be predictable from here? So let's say that we just, you know, that it goes the way it usually does. So there's this thing you kind of want, right? An emotion or a, a relationship or a coaching relationship or whatever. And it's like scary. And 
you're going to worry, you're going to get obsessed and all of this stuff's going to happen. And maybe it's not real anyhow. Maybe there's not someone out there and maybe coaching can't support you. So predictably from your fears, what will happen between you and I? Well, it's kind of what's been happening. Like I really like you and then I'm scared of you. So Mm -hmm. I avoid you for a bit, but then I don't really leave. Yeah. Nice. Does that happen in relationships too? Um, yeah, but I guess I've also felt like the people I like don't like me. So this is unique because you actually, you like me and then I like you and I don't know how to deal with it. Okay, cool. So I'm better than most of those other people, but that underlying fear for you, I'm kidding. You don't have to take that seriously, (laughs) but that underlying fear for you is still present. It sounds like, which is, "Ah, I'm kind of scared. So I'll just push it on the back burner. Is that right? Yeah. Got it. And if this keeps going the way relationships go and life goes, what's predictably going to happen here? If I just keep putting it off, I'm not going to learn the rest of the stuff that was like to be continued from our first session. And I really feel like there's something there that I need to look at because I can't figure it out. Got it. By myself. And if that's the thing that's not having me really choose the person I want, then maybe I won't choose them. Mm. So, can you see at least some degree of connection or parallel between what's happening with you and I and what's happening out there in, in your other parts of your life? Now I can. I just wasn't really sure before. Yeah. Nice work. Thanks for doing the work. That's not easy work to see this sort of stuff. And can you see there's a predictable way it'll go without making that wrong? Just like, oh, there's sort of like a reliable pattern to this. And reliable is kind of nice sometimes because we know what we'll get, but there's a predictable way this will go here, out there with the person you want. Yeah, I don't want to be afraid of the person I want. Yeah. And yet on some level you are, right? Yeah, because... yeah. I don't think I've ever really truly pursued the person I want. Yeah. So can you see to have this go differently is going to require something different. Like it's going to require almost like a kind of breakthrough kind of action as opposed to the default. Yes. Awesome. And can you see without any obligation to do anything different, but that for you and I to work together, it's going to require that same kind of action aside from the way it typically goes. Yes. Okay, cool. So we're going to pause it there, Kristen. You did amazing work. So I really want to acknowledge you for channeling that client and empathetically feeling what they felt. I felt you in that conversation with me. And I just want to share with people what we're going to do next. But I also, did y'all notice like Kristen kind of smile as the wire got connected there a little bit for her? That's, That's the thing we want. We're not fixing this for the client. We're not making them change it. We're just helping them see the path, the circle they're walking on and seeing the consequences of it and seeing that if they want it to go differently, it'll require a different action on their part. And from there, if we had more time, we would go into this with Kristen, but from there it becomes about, great, would you like my support with that? And then it's ultimately like, what are the actions that you, that you see to take? What's the support you need to take those actions? If it's around money, it might be that they need to have a conversation with someone. It might be that they need to look at their bank account a different way. It might be that they need to go and talk to someone about borrowing money. There's a million different ways it can go, but what we're doing is we're breaking up that cycle, that circle that everyone, all of us, myself included, gets caught in. So, Kristen, anything you would like to share or say before we kind of open it up to the group? I just wanted to say thank you for running it through with me. I thought that was a really beautiful experience. So, yeah, I appreciate you partnering with me on this. And thank you for Jason and Casey, too, for having this event. My pleasure. It's fun, right? Yeah, it was fun. (laughs) Yeah. So that's the possibility I want to enroll all of you in. That This can be fun with our client. If we are willing to not have this be significant, then our clients will join us in that. If we're like, this is fucking significant, 
<laughs> ah, our clients are going to feel that same kind of heaviness. So we've gone a little over, but I've got more time available. So we're going to go to the top of the hour and we'll do questions and answers or resistance, um, sorry, objections, any yeah buts or anything like that. Uh, Casey, anything I need to check in with you on before I just open the floor? Awesome. Okay, cool. So who's got questions, objections? Yeah, but what about that? Or anything else along those lines? How did yes. you? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I hear you first, Rebecca, and then Amanda, you're next. Go ahead, Rebecca. And hi. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, how how do you open the conversation? Like it was moving so fast at the beginning. And so I, you know, I feel like I really started paying attention after, I don't even know, a minute into it. So I'm like, how did he, how did he, how did he get here already? So. Uh, well, let, I'll give you an answer, but first, where do you, where do you find you get stopped getting into this conversation? Um, probably just starting it. Um, like there's the building the connection at the beginning. Um, like it's the, I set up a separate call for, they already know the rate, they already know the logistics. And so this would be a separate call. Um, but you just dive right in, I guess. Here, that here's where I would go to is like, first check back in with the possibility you created. Okay. So I'm just going to use you like, so Rebecca, you said you wanted like a fulfilling life. Here's the stuff that we talked about last time that you really want. This is your vision for the future. Okay. This is of utmost importance. If we don't have that, there's no real reason for the client to say yes to working with us other than they like you or they don't want to make you feel bad. And if people say yes to you from that place, they just quit a month later mm. or whenever you send them the invoice. So like, okay, Rebecca. So there was like, you want this job, you want to have time with your kids, you want to fly places, you want to be able to pick up and go at any point. And you, when we looked at that, you saw like the possibility for your kids really seeing leadership and adventure modeled for them. Do I have all that right? Is that still live for you? So we're re-presencing the vision for what's possible. You with me so far? Yeah. Once they're like a yes to that, we would say, okay, great. Do you want my support in creating that? Is that something you'd like? And if they say yes, we say, great. Here's what it looks like. And, and then that's when they'll give you like a, yeah, I want this, but here's the reason. At which point we say, got it. Would you like my support with that? And then we're into the conversation with them. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Cool. Great question. Uh, Amanda. I think the preamble to my question or the, the part of the answer might be, don't get yourself into that position in the first place. Let's but, find out. This is like an episode of- um, But if you, you, if you have got yourself into the position where you are exchanging emails or messages about it and thinking about the points that we started off the discussion, feeling, not authentic going back to someone so it feels like i'm only reaching out to them because i want to sell something how to probably change my mindset in that approach but also how to do that in an authentic way are you in an active conversation with them or is all the conversation happening over email i'm i'm in active conversation about other things okay but not but yet coaching. The, but but the, the, the coaching has been uh, through messages. Okay. Well, <clears throat> one, this is a bit of a thing, like I'm going to broaden first, and then I'll come back to what you've brought, Amanda. Mm -hmm. One, I want everyone to know it's okay for you to really want to support someone with coaching and to share that with them. Maybe. Most of us are like, I shouldn't have any agenda at all other than connecting, but that's weird. And so for me, I'm interested in connecting with people that are fascinating to me because one, it's a joy to do that. And two, because sometimes I meet clients that way and I love coaching and I love what we create in partnership. So when people are like, why are you reaching out? I'm like, for these two reasons. One, you seem like a fascinating person. I'd love to know more about you. And two, every now and then as I connect with fascinating people, I meet the next client. You might be that person, you might not. I don't know. 
So we can allow both of those things to exist instead of trying to pretend we have no interest in working with someone because that's just disingenuous. And mm -hmm. then we're trying to sell something instead of just being authentic. And what we're selling is really weird because we're trying to sell them that we don't want to work with them. <laughs> that's crazy. Okay, so Amanda, it sounds like what I'm hearing is you've, you have a relationship, you have connected with these people, but then there's this under channel sort of like coaching, maybe you're coaching them a little bit, or there's a conversation or hinting at it. So I would just bring it into the main conversation. I'd be like, look, are you interested in a coaching conversation? And I would shift it into a phone call. I, yeah. I'm enjoying this conversation with you. Would you like to have a coaching conversation with me? And if they're like, yeah, kind of great. Here's how it would look. So we always want to bring coaching is a dynamic, synchronous relationship. Email and instant message are asynchronous. They're like us lobbing monologues back and forth at people. So it's a terrible medium for anything coachy. It's fine for an invitation, but then we want to get onto the phone because that's where the magic will happen. Does that speak to your question, Amanda? It does. And it's coming back to that place of service and that passion for it. Yeah. And that's and the authentic. Yeah. And recognizing that there's two things you can recognize really serve people. The first is recognizing that um, being in a coaching conversation is a way to serve them. The second is that making an invitation they can say yes or no to serves them. Most of us make an invitation like this way. Amanda, if you'd ever like a coaching conversation, let me know sometime. That's an open loop. That has them be like, ah, Adam left that, but... I, mm, and it doesn't put them at any choice. So it's, it's, we do that because it's less edgy, it's less confronting, but it's also far less serving that person. Whereas if we say, are you interested in a coaching conversation with me? And then they go, no, we've just served them. We've given them an opportunity and we've let them close the loop. So now they can stop thinking about it. They don't have to do that thing where they're walking down the street and they see me and they are super fascinated with that seagull all of a sudden, just to not look at, at, at me with eye contact. So we can really serve people that way. Okay. And it's interesting hearing what you've just gone through with Kristen there. Um, what came up for me was working through my own fears in having those conversations as to what's going to happen if they say yes. Um, yes. So it's a lot of, about them as well as about me. So. Someone at my door. My ferocious Boston Terrier is gonna make sure we're safe. Uh, so thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. And you're absolutely right. This is another reason why this is such a sacred moment for us as coaches is it requires us being with our own fear. And that's mm -hmm. the heart of powerful coaching. A lot of coaching in the world is like the coach on this sort of raised, elevated status where they are like fearless. They've solved life. And then we come to them and they dispense wisdom to us. There's no fear involved with the coach. There's no getting down with us and being with us in a truly intimate relationship in that, which is why so many people do it. What we're looking at here is really being intimate with people, being willing to sit with our own fear and kind of modeling that for the client. We don't have to tell them I'm fucking terrified right now. Although sometimes you can do that. But if they're like, yeah, it's a bit scary for me to even talk about this. We'd be like, yeah, me too. But I'm, I'm down for it with you. And I feel there's some magic here. So let's explore it together. Are you up to meet me in that? That can be really powerful. Cool. Thank you. I, yeah, you bet. I see a question from Yana and then I see your hand, Caitlin. So we'll come to you next. So Yana writes, how does this, how does choosing the rate, our rate play into this? I'm about to choose a higher rate with a prospective client on Friday. And I want to make sure I am clean about it and not coming from a weird place about the money I'm asking for. So let's talk really quick about our rate. There's a lot of contexts we can have about our rate. Like one context is my rate is what the market is willing to pay, or my rate is what is reasonable. The context I use for my rate is that my rate is kind of like a line that I draw for which the client has to make that level of commitment to the life that they want. And so what that does is when I make a proposal with a client, I kind of have to check and be like, do we have enough on the table? that would be worth this rate for the client. That takes me out of the picture, mostly. I'm still a human, so I'm still like, ah. And when I raise my rate, I'm like, ah, because it's significant for me then. I have to practice. 
But over time, it stops being like, am I worth it? It's not a question about whether I'm worth it. It's, is this rate going to call this person forward into the vision that they've created? And if not, oh, I got some work to do. So that's where I would invite you to look at, Yana. Um, I know you're busy with little ones and stuff and probably can't come on to elaborate, but feel free to type something in there if, if you want us to elaborate a little bit. What do you have, Caitlin? Um, so my question is, how would you, after having this conversation with Kristen or while in it, how would you kind of bring it home and kind of tie it all together? Would it be more of like, a, what do you see from here? Or what do you make of all of this? And just like intuitively going about it? Or I guess, what's your perspective? Or how would yeah, you? Great question. Great. Everyone's bringing great questions. Thank you for this question. So one, the client can see, they're able to see, oh, I'm in that circle. And to create something different, it's going to require something different, right? That's where we kind of finished up. So my question would be, yeah, something along the lines of like, what do you see there is to do from here? Well, are you ready to take that step here? Do you want to take that action to begin working together? And if they're like, mm, no, great. We honor the no. We've done our work, right? We've helped them see this. And we've put them at choice in their life. So now they can see the pattern and it is still a perfectly acceptable choice to be like, I'm going back into that pattern just like Cyrus did in, in uh, the matrix, I'm really dating myself. He chose to take that pill and go back into the matrix. That is an acceptable choice. So it's okay for them to do that. And if they tell us, no, I don't think I wanna do that. Awesome, you did beautiful work today. Thank you so much. I'm gonna check in with you in four months time. Let me know if there's any support you'd like in between now and then. And I'm really excited to see what you create from here. If they say, yeah, I do, I think I'm ready. Then we wanna do a couple of things. We wanna get clear, support them to get clear on what actions they are to take. And two, we know in the back of our head that they've just taken a step into possibility. So fear is going to show up. So we want to check and see what structures do they need to set up to support them not having fear when. So be like, what actions do you see to take, Kristen? She might be like, okay, I, I want to pay that invoice. Send me an invoice. Great. So that's an action. And then the next question to go to that second part would be like, once you get that invoice in your email, what's predictable? What will predictably happen? I'm going to see like five other emails and I'm going to get really focused on those. And I'm going to like then turn over here and start putting my attention on something that makes money. I'm just making all this up, right? But like makes money rather than money leaving my account. And I'm going to start to notice blah, blah, blah. Great. What would support you not having things go back into that predictable way that it goes? This is exactly like a project your client takes on, right? Oh, I, th I see the thing to do is to have 20 scary conversations with people. Great, what's gonna happen on Monday when you sit down to do that? Ah, great, what structure would support you to do that? So we're just supporting them to see what actions do I take here to create that breakthrough result and what structures are gonna support me to actually go through with it. Does that make sense? Awesome, great question. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Who else? I have a question. Let's hear uh, it. Yeah, so you said, uh, you know, to contact clients that you want to find out more about that you're fascinated by. But then there's one person that I have in mind that I, I like him. I, for me, I kind of see that he doesn't like his life the way it is right now. He's very stressed. He's overwhelmed. He's uh, not that happy. And I see potential. So I'm wondering how do I approach him now from a place of fascination? I, mean, I don't want to be like leading, but yeah. it seems like he could use some help there. So I'm gonna provide some, um, a couple of things here. <clears throat> the first is the way you are relating to this person is very common which is like you're present to what's not maybe working so well. And you're kind of present to like, uh, that's, that's important that we can see that in people. But what I'm less present to in your speaking, David, is what you kind of see is possible for this person. So this is where most coaches approach people from. They're like, this person's a fucking mess. And I'm not saying that you're saying that. It's just fun for me to say that. But that's a little bit in their energy. They're like, this person's a disaster. I'll reach out to them. They could really fucking use me. 
And so what happens is these people feel themselves approached, connected, whatever, through that lens of being related to. No one wants to say yes to that. So then we approach them and they're, even though we haven't said a single word, our energy precedes us. And so this person energetically is going to be a bit guarded. And then we're going to open our mouth and that same energy is going to be conveyed and they're going to hear it and they're going to guard more. And pretty soon it's hard to even connect with them. Mm. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So what we want to do with people, there's nothing wrong with seeing that as people as a starting point. That can be like the North Star. But then we want to start to look like, what do I see as possible for this person? Like if this person shifted that stuff out of the way, what do I imagine would become possible in their lives? Who do I see they would become? What would be the impact in areas of their life, like their work, their finances, their spirituality, their friendships, their family? And you want to start to think along those lines. And what that's going to do is you're going to shift away your thinking and you're relating to them. You're going to shift away from here's the mess to like, holy fuck, here's what's possible. And from that place, first of all, reaching out to people is way more fun because you're like, I'm excited to meet this person. That guy seems like a bit of a mess. I'm willing to do it to make money, but eh, I'm not that motivated to connect with them. You know what I mean? So it makes connecting with people more fun. And sorry, do you have a question? Me? Yeah. No, no. I okay. Listening. I saw you move. I wasn't sure if there was a question. There. So it makes it more fun for us to reach out. And then the energy that they're met with, when we do the work to see people through that lens, we become like a signal that cuts through the noise of the ordinary. The noise of the ordinary is everyone relates to people through the way you just described. Look at that person. They're not that helpful. Look at, look at that person. They seem kind of miserable. And that's how everyone relates to them. And then they kind of tolerate each other that way. When we do that work as a coach to really see like what would be possible for this person and then relate to them as that possibility already. Suddenly they have this experience where they're like, man, when I talk to David, there's a different experience I have fundamentally. And that yeah. sparks curiosity, fascination, joy, interest, all of that sort of stuff. I can see on your face, it seems like that might give you a different place to show up with people. Is that right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally like that. yeah thank you. Yeah. Fuck yeah, brother. Nice work. Great <laughs> question. Really, really good question. Who else? I'll get some support on an objection I'm getting right now. If you're Great. Okay. Yes, of um, course. So, I've, and I've gotten this objection like a couple of times recently. So I'm curious about it. Um, and it's someone who is in my pipeline and we've done like an initial, he's like a warm referral from a coach who's a good friend. We've done an initial discovery session and he keeps like saying yes to moving through my process. So we're going to do a full complimentary session next to what do you really, really want conversation? Yeah. And like from the very beginning, he's like bringing like a, but I don't know if coaching is really the right thing for me, like right. all through the process. And I feel like he's setting me up like, like, but I'm not like a marrying kind of guy. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I don't get it. From him. Got it. Um, so what, when you hear that, what does that evoke in you? Oh, totally. It like activates my fear. Like, oh, I need to prove that coaching is real or that I'm good. Great. And, and then in what ways do you do that? I'm sure that to some extent you distinguish that or like, okay, that's there. But in what ways does that show up? Um, being really sweaty at the end of the call. Um, <laughs> Great. <laughs> Definitely like talking about coaching, like, oh, this is how I work with people. And there was some enrollment around it. Like, let's get clear on what you really want. But yeah. definitely I did more talking than I would normally do. Great. Great noticing, Catherine. Really, really great that you can even catch that. <clears throat> so super common experience. You've got someone, right, that's like right out of the gate, letting you know, just so you know, don't get your hopes up. So it's really helpful, I find, to relate to that as just fear showing up. Oh, this person's scared. And so this person, one of the things they've learned to do with their fear is preemptively set up some walls so they're safe. We all do this in our own ways. Some people set up the wall after the fact, some people kick you out after they build a wall, it doesn't really matter. It's just like, oh, this person's got some fear. And it can be really helpful for us to recognize that the act of entering into a coaching relationship with someone is an incredibly vulnerable, courageous act. We take it for granted. Most of us 
they work with their own coach. We're like, yeah, you have no fucking deal every week. But I got to tell you, every week I show up, probably every three weeks, and I'm like, I don't have a coaching request. Maybe I'll cancel this call. It gets me. And I've been in this business for a long time. So we want to first honor just the fear. We don't want to point to it because that's weird, but we just want to hold in our body like, oh, this person's just got some fear showing up. Like, man, they're courageous. Mm -hmm. And if we are going to speak to anything, we might just honor their courage. Hey, first of all, totally got that. And I want to honor your courage just for being here on this call with me. Thank you. I appreciate it. So that's the first thing. And if we can start to relate to it that way, it makes it easier not to take so personally when we're like, fuck you, guy. Yeah, totally. Put me on the back foot already, right? The second thing is, um, I'm going to share a story. I'd just like to see a show of hands, people that know who Steve Chandler is. Does anyone know that coach? Okay. Steve Chandler's this hilarious, some people call him the godfather of coaching. It's this old dude from Arizona. He's, um, he's gone bankrupt like so many times. He was an alcoholic. He's incredible. And he's an amazing coach. And he's very droll. If you hear him speak, he'll put you to sleep. And then every now and then he'll say something really, really funny. And I was working with Steve, who's my coach very briefly. And he was telling me how he got on this phone. He got a referral from a client and he got on the phone. It was this lawyer and he got on the phone and this lawyer was grilling him, like asking him all these questions, like, well, what about this? And what certifications? Very lawyer-like, right, Rebecca? And, um, and Steve was like, man, you know, as this guy was talking to me, I started to feel like, who am I to coach this guy? And so there came this point where Steve said to the guy, like, okay, well, it seems like I'm not the one for you. Like, you know, I don't meet your criteria. I'm starting to feel like I don't even know if I should be coaching. You know, he's bringing a little <laughs> playfulness to it. So now that we've established that and that I'm not the one for you, do you want to use the rest of our time just to take a look and see if we can support you anyhow with whatever's there? So Steve is letting that person do whatever he wants to do. He's allowing himself to feel whatever he's got to feel, and he's totally unattached to whether or not this person becomes a client or not. He's not trying to convince the guy that he's worthy of working with a lawyer. He's not trying to, he's not falling on his sword and being like, you're right, let's end the call right now. He's just like, yeah, okay. I don't, sounds like I don't really meet your criteria. And we got some time left. Are you interested in using that time for something? So, in your situation, I would probably be inclined to do something else. Like, got it. You don't want to work with a coach. Why don't we just take that off the table entirely? Mm -hmm. And now we've still got this hour ahead. Would you like to take a look and see what might be available in your life? Mm -hmm. And when we do that, you, you can think of it kind of like being a martial artist or an Aikidoist. Yeah, totally. So they come at you with like a, you know, a, you're not going to get me, Catherine. And then what you do is like, got it. I'm not going to get you. You receive that energy and that disarms them mm -hmm. because they feel gotten by you. And they're like, oh, okay, she's not going to get me. Then that channel can open back up and they can receive you. Totally right. Yeah, like he doesn't have to defend or protect himself from me anymore. Yeah, exactly. You just meet him in that and love him, showing up exactly obnoxiously the way he is. I know. Okay. And this is so much of our work. It's just like, you'll see your, your, over time, your eyes start to gleam with delight at your clients as they show up shitty. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. I love the context of intimacy and the relationship, like being willing to be scared at the same time. Really great. Yes. As we deepen into that, this work becomes, I mean, I, you've heard me say this word a, a few times, but so, so sacred. And from that place, coaching becomes something deeply spiritual, deeply transformative from both coach and client and objections, creating clients becomes every bit as sacred as any other part of what you do with your clients. And so that's the promise of what we're talking about here, this context to come into. We've got time for a few more, so let's use that time. Who else has something? Yes, Rebecca. Um, how do you, like, so if you already have an existing client and you decide you uh, want to increase your rate and you've already mm -hmm. done that with other clients, this client has no idea that, you know, there's other clients out there at an increased rate. How do you um, go about having that conversation? I'll provide an answer, but how do you, how would you go about having that? Like, what do you think, Rebecca? Um, well, you said earlier, um, 
my rate has to make that level of commitment from the client. Um, you know, is this rate going to call this person forward into the vision they've created for themselves? And so I thought that was very um, captivating. And so I'm curious. So I guess there's, I, I think I want to include that. Um, but I don't know if that's just me justifying and creating a justification. Um, yeah, I'm just normally a straight shooter. So I just want to like say, Hey, this is the shift. I'm doing an overhaul. This is what's happening. Are you on board? But then it's like, uh, is that abrupt? Uh, may I provide a bit of a reflection? Yes. So that it occurs, like there's a lot of you trying to figure it out. Right. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like I honor that part of you because, you know, I, I know you have background in law and, and like that brilliant mind of yours is going to serve your clients so much because you're going to be able to follow all of the stuff and all of the threads that they have. And clients have a lot of threads. They're bake, they're making spaghetti. And what we're talking about fundamentally is a conversation rooted in intimacy rather than right ways to do things. The right way to do thing is absent intimacy. As an aside, that's why our society these days is so lacking in intimacy is because everyone's terrified of doing dating and, and sex and all of that wrong. So they're turning to rules to follow and there's no intimacy in rules. Rules take away intimacy. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by it being, by Catherine, being a fundamentally intimate conversation is, hey client, I'm raising my rates. This is what it's gonna start costing. And then the intimacy is like, what, get, what got driven up with your client and what got driven up with you? And all there really is, is to be with that. And, you know, there's best practices and stuff like that, but fundamentally at the heart of it is a willingness on our part to put something in front of the client and then let the client have the reaction they have and then to navigate that with them. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Here's how I would do it. I'm gonna give you an answer all the same. I would just be like, hey, client, um, I'm raising my rates. It's going to go from this to this. Any thoughts? What's going on? I just want to make sure that you don't feel like the rug's pulled out from under you. I want to make sure you feel cared for throughout this. So what's going on with you? And then I would just be in that conversation with them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. Thank you. Who else? I got one for you. Cool. How, uh, so, so a lot of my coaching conversations are sparked from like connecting with people, old friends, connections, um, like, Hey, love to hear what you're up to. I'd love to share what I'm working on. And the, the conversations are like incredible. Sometimes they're even really powerful and like intimate. Um, but it always turns into, oh, I've got a ton of people I'd love to refer to you. And like, you definitely sparked something in me when you were like, put them at choice. Are you interested in a coaching conversation? But my yeah. question is like, in those conversations where there's a connection and obviously I have some sales context coming up here. Cause there's like a, you know, form of friendship or relationship that existed. How do I create like possibility to get that person to actually open up to the possibility of them like working in partnership and coaching and talking. And a lot of people are even closed off to like think big about their life. Um, so I guess I'm just curious, like how, how would you shift the conversation to like get them to, be in that space as opposed to just like constantly being like, that's so amazing. I'm going to refer you to other people that could mm. work. With you. Let me make sure I've got it right. Yeah. So you're in a conversation with someone, for example, yeah. and you're wanting to have a conversation that inspires them to be a yes to coaching as opposed to this is cool for other people. Is that right? Yeah. Well, you probably just brought up a good point of like lack of clarity going into the conversation. I think I'm open to like either. Yes send me referrals or like, would you be interested in coaching? But it, it, maybe it's not very clear at all. And that's an issue. Um, but, but which is it that you were wanting to create just so I'm clear? I mean, really, I want anyone I talk to to be willing to have a coaching conversation with me. Um, okay. Well, here's what I would, anyways. <laughs> yeah, here's what I would suggest. I'm just going to give you a, a thing. So yeah. are you familiar with the notion of a possibility conversation? Yep. I'm Great. going to be here right now. Awesome. Congrats. It's yeah. quite a ride, isn't it? Yeah. Epic. So the possibility conversation is the most important conversation because that's where we kind of get clear on like, what does that person really want in our life? People like me, when I started, jumped right into coaching people brilliantly. And then where they were left was like, guy's really smart and he seems good at coaching, 
but I don't know what I'm going to get out of this. So I guess I'll just pass on this offer. So what I would do in your situation is one, put people at choice and just make an offer. So it'd be like, hey, you're cool. I've enjoyed this conversation. Are you interested in a conversation with me for an hour where we just get clear on the possibility of your life, what you would love to create if all bets were off and you can make anything happen and let them be a yes or no to that. Yeah, cool. Okay. That enrolls people in coaching. And then at the end, you can put them at choice again. Is this something you'd like? No, I think I'm good. Okay. Do you know anyone that would be a good fit for me? Maybe. Okay. Do you, do you not? So you're putting them at choice. Yeah. Cool. Did that give you something yeah, that empowered you? Yeah, yeah, no, it empowered me. It landed actually. I think that's the piece I'm missing. And it's maybe I'm like skipping it on purpose due to some fear there. Um, totally. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's Appreciate what most of us do. We, yeah. we step over putting people at choice because we're afraid because yeah. if we put them at choice, you might get a no, right? Or they might feel a little confronted because being at choice in our life, we're often not put that way. We're raised without being at choice. Do this, clean your room. Mom, can I have ice cream? I don't get much choice in any of this stuff. So it's actually standing for people before they're working with you and serving them when we put them at choice. Cool. Thank you. Um, did anyone else have one last conversation or one last question before we wind down? Great. I'm going to come to Yana's follow-up question and then we're, I'm going to turn it over to you, Casey and Jason. So Yana's follow-up question is, how do you put a number on what it would take the client to become the commitment required for the awesome possibility we've created? So Yana's question is effectively like, well, how do I know what the number is for what the client wants to create? So at the end of the day, your rate is just what you decided your rate was. That's it. And you can come up with all of these fancy ways to sort of empower the rate you've chosen. But at the end of the day, it's a choice. So oftentimes for brand, brand, brand new coaches, I think $500 a month and a three-month minimum commitment is a really great rate because it requires them to stand for something from their client. People won't just throw $500 away but it's also achievable. It's not so much money that the client's gonna become incontinent when they propose their rates. As you spend more time with this, you get to choose what your rate is. And where we're looking for is a rate that will call your client and you forward, but that's not so scary that it just makes you unable to speak. And it's not so scary that it's like the client's like, yo, you seem cool, but I don't have a million dollars just to invest. And you don't have the capacity to call forward that from your client. So there's not, there's not a real like, so let's read what Jana's just written. My current rate is 1500 a month and I want to propose 15K for six months. So let's do the math. 1500 times six is 9,000. So it's about a $6,000 increase. So I think that's a great rate. And I don't think that Jana, you know, I'm speaking for and to Jana. I don't think Jana needs to create much of a justification. It costs 15K to work with me. That's what it costs to work with me. Just like it requires a willingness to call her on the phone or to get on Zoom or to talk to her during business hours as opposed to evening hours. So what happens is we make our rate super significant and then feel we have to justify it, but we don't any more than we have to justify the days during the week that we work or the hours that we work or whether we work over phone or Zoom or anything like that. Okay. I see your hand, Amanda, but alas, I want to honor our time because I've already blown through the original time limit. And so um, we're going to have to wind down there. So I'll turn it over to you, Casey, you, Jason, and I would love to actually maybe before I do that, I'll just invite everyone. If we're not already connected, please connect with me on Facebook. Reach out to me. I love the conversation. As you can tell, I'm super passionate about this and I'm really committed to coaches thriving, not by way of you working with me just us thriving. So if you have questions, if you have follow-up, if, um, if you want to like know more about any of this stuff, I'm an absolute yes. I'm completely committed to um, supporting all of us, the coaching profession and thriving. Okay, that's what I've said. Adam, thank you so much. I've noticed you haven't drank any water in the last hour or so. It's empty. It's empty. All right. Everybody, as we wrap up here, I want you to quickly, in the chat, put down one thing that you've taken away from tonight that you can go and use this week. Like Casey and I are all about head, 
useful information that you can go out and use to get hired, get hired at a rate. That's why we have people like Adam and Lisa and Marie come in because they are committed to the same thing. So throw that in the chat. Adam, again, thank you. Anything else you want to say here as we wrap up? Um, yeah, mostly just uh, I want to invite each of you to keep practicing holding this with reverence and to have a lot of grace with yourself. So it's easy in this moment. We're like, fuck yeah, reverence. I'm going to I'm going to like go and be with my client's fear and love them and see possibility. And then you're going to forget about that when you're present with it. And that's the work. Like the work is we remember and then we forget and then we remember and then we forget. And forgetting is so beautiful because remembering is so beautiful. And so we want to I want to invite each of you to just see this as like a beautiful opportunity and to continue to step into it and to really trust yourself and your client. The fact that you're here already means you're ahead of the game. Casey, take us home. Yeah. Who here got value out of this conversation? Can I see some hands? Cool. Um, oh, I just had my, um, my screen time went off, so I could not see anyone for a minute. <laughs> So reliable. Um, yeah, so if you got value out of this, we're featuring coaches like Adam, amazing enrollers every month in our in our community. And if you want to be part of an ongoing conversation, we have some just amazing coaches that we are so honored to to host. Um, and we're providing other support as well with pipeline building, marketing, and that kind of thing. But we want to show that showcase the diversity because really there's no one way to do this. Um, and that's something that can be a learning curve um, for coaches who are starting out. Um, so you can join at the link in the chat there. And we are just so honored and pleased to be in this conversation with you all. So thanks for being committed to people's potential and being change makers in the world. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Adam, so much. Um, is there anything you're up to you want to announce? There's like a million things. Um, the probably the biggest things uh, you can follow my podcast. It's called Get Lit. It's a conversation about leadership and all of this sort of stuff. Twenty to thirty minute episodes, and I also do live coaching and uh, reviews of coaching calls. So if you want to hone your blade that way, there's that. And the other thing I'll just briefly put in the chat here is the Forge, which my wife and I, who both led accomplishment coaching's work, um, run. So that's for coaches and leaders that want to step their game up. So that's another way to. Um, dive into this conversation. And then lastly, I put a lot of my art on Facebook. So just come hang out there, be a part of the conversation. Let's play together. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everyone for joining. See you Bye, everyone. Bye, Thank everybody. you so much. See you guys. Bye. Thanks, Adam. Bye.